Well, good morning. It's good to be in God's house this morning. We're going to continue our series this morning on what it means to be a healthy church. This is kind of exciting. What, is it, what does it mean to look like a healthy church? You know, in a couple months, uh, you're going to be beginning the process of calling a new lead pastor. And uh, we, what we think about when we, when we think about that is this idea is we're going to bring somebody in and we're going to interview them. But you know what? They're also interviewing you. They're having a conversation with you and wanting to learn a little bit about this place. And so it's imperative that we as a, a body, as a family, as a group of people, be as healthy as we can possibly be uh, when we begin this process, because that's going to play a significant role in calling the next lead pastor. God can do great things in and through this congregation if we're seeking his plan for us and then obediently walking into that plan. Stepping into that plan. Last week we started this series with a look at a church at Corinth and we're shifting this morning and we're going to move into uh, the book of Revelation. Now last week we talked about this church at Corinth and the fact that they were sort of dividing up by following certain key men. Some were following Paul and some were following Apollos and and, and they were kind of chasing after them and um, instead of chasing after Jesus, instead of Seeking Jesus and following Jesus. This morning we're going to start a look at seven different churches that are talked about in in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3. Now when I say the book of Revelation, how many are super excited to look at the book of Revelation? How many? How many are terrified? Anybody terrified to look at the book of Revelation? Anybody sort of thoroughly confused when they look at the book of Revelation? Well, we're going to be looking at the front end of the book of Revelation over the next, uh, well, about a month and a half. And in that front half, in chapters 2 and chapters 3, there are letters to seven actual churches that existed during the time. When we think about prophecy, we tend to think about future prediction. And that happens in the book of Revelation. It happens more after chapter 3. For our purposes this morning, we're going to look at these seven churches. Now, a note I want to make is this. We are going to be using the uh, English uh, standard version for this little series. Normally I use the NIV, it's, it's sort of the ease of, of language and it's easy to comprehend and grasp. I'm shifting just for this series to the English standard version because I, I like the literal nature of the language when we're talking about the imagery that's being used uh, by John in this book. So what's the purpose of Revelation? Let me give it to you just pretty simply here. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, this is found in Revelation 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So the key phrase there is probably verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, right? Hearing and doing. The author of this book is John. Now it's John of Patmos. Some call him John the Revelator. The Apostle John by tradition. It was written somewhere between 80 and 90 A.D., It was written on an island called Patmos, which was sort of a rough area that in all likelihood John had been uh, exiled to due to persecution. And it's kind of confusing, Revelation, because it, it, it uses a couple different kinds of writing. Now, in the part we're going to be looking at, chapters 2 and chapter 3, it's really mostly letter form. But not all letter form. It also uses what we call apocalyptic language or apocalyptic literature. And we really don't have any kind of similar literature in our world today. It's a little bit different than what we're used to. So at the beginning of Revelation, John has a specific message to these seven churches. And in each of the seven churches, there's a format followed. Okay? I'm not going to go over this every week, but I thought it would be helpful to go over it week one. First off, each letter is addressed to an angel. A title is given for Christ in each of these little letters. There is an honest critique of each church. John looks at each church and says, you're doing this well. But you probably need to work on this. And then finally, there is a promise given. 
at the end of each one of these little snippets. A promise given for the church that obeys and is obedient. So let's talk for a second about the concept of the, it's written to an angel. A lot of people have discussed, well, who is the angel? What is each of these angels that it's referring to? Some people believe the angel is an actual angel at each church. Some people believe the angel may have been a reference to a leader or a group of leaders in each church. Some people think that it was perhaps just a reference to the corporate spirituality of each of these local congregations. Now, this last one seems to make the most sense to me in terms of the context of how it is written, the content of the letters, and the idea that these letters as written were meant to be read aloud to these congregations. So it may have been just a reference to the corporate spirituality. What was the purpose? I think in these first uh, two, or second and third chapter, the purpose is not so much foretelling future prophecy, but it's really kind of a fourfold design in each one of these letters. First off, it's designed to prepare people. John knows that he's writing to a church that is going to face challenges, that's going to face persecution, that's going to face trials. And, and so he wants to give them a realistic view of a lay of the land. Now, next, I think it's meant to encourage. And some of these letters are very encouraging. We'll see in our first one this morning that there's encouragement given. And it's to give us a new way of seeing power. A new way of seeing power. And then finally, it's meant to challenge, to challenge, to move forward. If it's a road map, it's a map revealing the very nature of God in each one of these realities. And it's designed to get people to think about a new empire, a God empire, not the empire of the local world that they're living in. So let's step into our first church this morning out of respect for God's word. Why don't we stand? I'm going to be reading Ephesians, or excuse me, Revelation chapter 2, the first seven verses. It says this, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. How you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. Verse 3, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. And then he says this in chapter 4, but I have this against you. You've abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do, not, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Verse 6, yet this you have. You hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Lord Jesus, Help us this morning as we look through this passage to not evaluate necessarily those around us, but evaluate ourselves. To look at ourselves, Jesus, and see where we are like you, and in those areas where we are like you, through the power of your uh, spirit, grant us more ability to be even more like you. But in those areas, God, where we're not like you, convict us and give us passion to change. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Ephesus was a church that had right belief. They believed the right things. They had good theology, but they had wandered from love. They'd wandered from their first love, their love of God. And here's the challenge, and this is maybe the most important thing this morning. When we separate ourselves from the love of God, when we lose our passion for loving God, we lose our ability to love properly. Now, we can kind of love, and we can maybe even do a pretty good job of loving. But when we love God first, we love everything else better. Now, years ago, I was uh, what is called the Washington Pacific District Church of the Nazarene NYI president. NYI is the Nazarene Youth Organization globally, and I was the NYI president for um, way too long, but I was the Nazarene youth pastor leader for a lot of years. Now, is anybody here familiar with Bible quizzing? Okay, we had a very active Bible. Do we have any former Bible quizzers here? Look at that, legends, 
legends. So you can quiz them right after the service. They'll be in the lobby and you okay, no, I'm sorry. But we had this quizzing program on the district and um, we had a group from outside of the denomination ask if they could quiz with us. And uh, they were a very uh, interesting group. They were, they were very fundamentalist and they were as I have started to observe them, I realized pretty legalistic. Now, they were really, really good Bible quizzers. Really good Bible quizzers. But they would show up each week, and when we did Bible quizzing on this district, we had a worship service oftentimes at the beginning, and we had a, a Bible study at the beginning of each quiz event. And they would not participate. And they would not, they would not participate with that. They were just there to quiz. Now, if you, if you win a lot at the quizzing level at the local level, you go on to regionals, and we had never allowed them to go on to regionals. And uh, their, their pastor came to me and said, would you allow us to go to regionals? And I said, well, perhaps. I'll have to check with our regional authority, but here's the deal. I'm not interested you in, in, in you in just quizzing. If you're going to participate alongside of us, you need to participate alongside of us. And that means if you're going to come to our regional quizzing event, you'll go to all the events. You'll participate in the Bible study that we do collectively beforehand. You'll participate in the worship service. And he goes, well, I'll get back to you. And he, he called me uh, a, a while later and said, we'll, we'll commit to that. We'll commit to that. And we got down to Northwest Nazarene University, and it was our first morning, and we were having our worship service. And midway through the worship service, they got up in mass and walked out. And I went out and I said, why did you walk out? And he said, well, we disagree with the theology that's being taught in there. Now, I don't think they had right theology. I think they were wrong on this matter. But you see, their life had become, uh, 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 their their self-value had become in believing absolutely that they had the right belief seeing it as exclusionary, and divorcing love from their faith, in my opinion. They had separated themselves. It is possible to believe all the right things in the world, but not love. And if we don't love, then here's the challenge. We don't believe all the right things if we don't love. John starts out by referring to seven stars and lampstands. Seven is a perfect number in Scripture. It it indicates completion or perfection. It's the desired outcome. It's as God intended. Uh, Think of like the seven days of creation, perfect in design. John actually gives a real detailed explanation of what the stars and lampstands mean in Revelation 1. In verse 20, he says, As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. The key here is this. And I think the key phrase in that little passage is this, in my right hand. God holds the churches in his hand. God is is carrying the churches. He wants the best for them. He is powerful. He is among us. The the obstacles that any church faces, and Aurora is no difficult, can seem massive, particularly in the society we live in. But remember, the creator of the universe holds us in his right hand. That's pretty cool. Church, we're being held today. We can feel weak, we can feel challenged, we can feel broken down, but Jesus holds us in his right hand. He desires the best for the churches. Now, John starts out with this critique of Ephesus. He says this in verses 2 and 3 and then verse 6. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and you ha- how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you've not grown weary. Yet this you also have. Verse 6, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The, the first part of this critique, or much of this critique, is very positive to this church, right? There was a lot to commend. There was a lot to praise about the church of Ephesus. And I would say many of those things... In my observation, as somebody who's just been here for a a limited amount of time, many of those things exist here at Aurora. They are hardworking. They're patient. 
They have endured. They hate evil. They are very focused on the mission that God has set them out to do. And, and they've stayed strong. They're not weary. They keep on moving forward. He says this, you've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. The Ephesian church was correct doctrinally. Let me make it clear this morning. I think it's important to be correct doctrinally. I think it's important to be correct theologically. Right belief is important. It's absolutely important, but it cannot become divorced from our heart. It may have been hard, by the way, for the Ephesian church to be right in their belief, to, to stand firm in what they believed. It may have been very difficult. It's not surprising that, that John listed the Ephesians church first. Uh, it was the church in the largest city mentioned. So of all the seven churches, this is the one that exists in the largest metropolitan area. It was a diverse hub of commerce, politics, art, and culture. It was a seaport city, so where there were lots of people coming and lots of people going. And it was a center of religion. There were lots of religions, lots of cult worship, lots of false religion in the area. There were lots of temples to gods and idols. Now, fortunately, here in Seattle, we don't have anything like that, right? It's okay to laugh. They lived among masses that lived in opposition to what they believed. So, in all actuality, the region we live in is very much like Ephesus. This letter to Ephesus really can apply to North Seattle, Shoreline, Montlake Terrace, South Snohomish County in 2023. They were pretty good at sniffing out bad teaching. I'm getting to know some of you, and I learned that many of you have some real strong theology that's good theology, and so when you hear bad teaching, it kind of perks your ears, right? He actually mentions a group here called the Nicolaitans. Now, there's not a whole lot known about the Nicolaitans. They would have self-identified as a Christian sect, as Christians, but they were very much engaged in idol worship. And, and their idol worship centered a lot around perverse sexual practices, just to be blunt. And, and what made it worse was, this wasn't something they did on the side in secret or something hidden. They actually made it a part of their religious practice. They actually did these wrong things in the name of their faith. They pretended it was spiritual. Their idolatry became a part of their practice. And the church at Ephesus wouldn't be sucked in. John commends them for this. He praises them for this. Good job, he says. But then right in the middle of this, he says this. And this is the key point this morning. The problem with the church is Ephesus is they'd lost their love. They'd lost their love. They'd become separated from their love. Verse 4, but this I have against you. You've abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. That's pretty heavy language there, isn't it? I'll take you out of my hand. I'll remove my protection. Remember when you first came to Christ? Do you remember the passion? Remember the intensity? Remember the love? Folks, we need to reclaim that love. If this church is going to succeed, it succeeds best if each one of us as individuals are reclaiming that love, are seeking out that love, returning to that love, their first love. Church, have we lost our love? The, uh, the Nicolaitans fell for sex and food sacrifice to idols. Now, you know, from a distance, it's easy to kind of commit, condemn those things, right, and go, well, I would never do that. Those are things I, I wouldn't do. But in America, in Shoreline, in 2023, do we love things before we love God? Do we put things in front of God? The question all of us have to ask is this, and there's only one right answer. What do we love first? What do we love first? Because by definition, anything that we love more than God is an idol, period. 
Now, those can be bad things, right? We'd all agree that drugs and, you know, gambling and those kind of things. We go, well, okay, okay those, those, those are idols. But anything we love more than God can become idolatrous. In our culture, sports and entertainment, uh, first off, let me commend you. The Seahawks are playing right now. And you chose to be here. Good job. In our society, we, we rearrange our lives and our schedules for things that we love, right? We want to know what we love? Look at our calendars and look at our checkbook ledgers. And we'll find what we love. We'll find what's important to us. What do we love first? I think one of the challenges we have is we have a really bad economy of love. What do I mean by that? This is what I mean. Many of us see love as something finite, like a limited resource, like money. I'm limited in the amount of love. I I have only so much love to give. The older I get, I think that's bad theology. I think that's really bad theology. Because of this, when we love God first, your capacity to love increases. Let me say that again so you don't miss that point. When we love God first, I believe that our capacity to love well actually grows. Okay? Love God first and you love your children better. Okay? Now we think, our, our, by the way, kids and family, grandkids, those can become idols, can't they? And we think, well, I got to love them first. But here's the thing. Love God first, you love them better. Love God first and you love them better. Why? Why is that the case? Because when you love God first and you're engaged in this loving relationship with God, where you're spending time with God daily, not just one day a week, when you're walking with God, when you're in conversation with God, when you're praying without ceasing, Your love starts to be shaped by God's love. Your love starts to look like the love of Jesus. It's really quite powerful. It's particularly true, and this is very important here. I think one of the ways we learn to love is by fully realizing how God loves us. Let me say this. If you're here this morning, and I know this is the case, because I've been there myself. And by the way, it's possible for a pastor to be there even when they're pastoring, even after they've pastored for 30 years, to at times feel, I'm not worthy of love. Why would God love me? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but has anybody ever felt that way? Boy, if God only knew, why would he love me? Why would he care for me? Romans 5. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You notice the order there? What that passage out of Romans doesn't say is, we sort of moved towards God and started making some changes. And God sort of noticed it and thought, well, maybe they're worthy of love. I'm going to love them. That's not the order there right? What happens there in that passage is pretty specific. While we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. Amen? I mean, that's a big deal, isn't it? That means that there is no one who is walking down Aurora Avenue this morning that God didn't die for. That neighbor who has signs in their yard that drives you crazy, I've got some bad news for you. God loves them, and God died for them. I'm being facetious. That's good news, isn't it? When we realize where God found us and chose to love us, it helps us to look out at a broken world and go, okay, I'm going to choose to love them too. When I see brokenness and broken people, when they drive me crazy, it's important for me to realize, a little self-talk here, Mike, you were broken. And Jesus died for you. The message to the church at Ephesus is very simple. You can do right actions with the wrong heart. 
They can do right actions with a wrong heart. And let me say this. Right belief, right belief without love is not right belief. Right belief without love is not right belief. If you remove love from the equation, no matter what you do, you are not engaging in good theology. Love needs to be at the forefront. Now, here's an actual verse of prophecy from Jesus. This is actual foretelling in Matthew 24, verse 10. Talking about the end of the age, Jesus says, At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Verse 12, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Jesus says at the end of the age, many who were walking with God will wander away, will lose their love, will be like Ephesus. Here's the thing. And I'm, I'm not going to kind of mince my words here. We, we, live in, we live in dangerous times, don't we? We live in ugly times, don't we? People are wandering away from the faith rapidly. And much of what passes for faith in 2023 in America is, is simply politics with maybe some Bible verses tacked on. We can't start with our politics. We have to start with Jesus. We can't start with our finances. We have to start with Jesus. Jesus is first. Jesus has to come first. We're very good at seeing the other guy's wickedness. But I think if we're going to change our community, we start with us first, right? And we realize, well, I was still a sinner. We also realize that I occasionally, you know, screw up. I know this, and you would know that I still am not a perfect person by driving with me uh, in a roundabout. Because um, you will see me act in ways that are contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ occasionally, right? We still mess up, don't we? But God's love saves. God's love salvages. God's love reaches out to us. And that's the kind of love we're supposed to emulate. We have to love them before they believe the same things we believe. This church needs to grow, right? We grow by loving. We grow by reaching out to those who are broken, who are isolated, who are hurting. Can we be a church that pushes back against the deficit of love that exists in our society? Let me tell you one simple way we could do this. For those of us who are on social media, it's to start acting like Jesus when we're on social media. I know far too many Christians who engage in name-calling and all sorts of ugliness on social media. That looks nothing like Jesus, period. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe there's such a thing as sin. In fact, John is very clear right in this letter that they had the right belief regarding sin. But it's possible to have the right belief about sin and not have a relationship with Jesus. Isn't that weird? That's, that's fully possible. As I was preparing this week, I had an epiphany as I was you know, thinking about the Aurora family here, and it's, you're my family right now. As the days grow harder, as the world seems more crazy, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned with our local church maintaining its correct beliefs. That is a concern of mine. That's a concern of most pastors. But I'm probably more concerned. In fact, I'll say it. I'm not probably more concerned. I am more concerned about us loving right. Because if we love right, it means we understand Jesus right. And if we understand Jesus right, it means our theology will fall into place. Love is relationship. If we're involved in a deep, loving relationship with Jesus, it will change us. We need to return to that first love. John 13, 35. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. So when somebody walks in off of um, Meridian or off 175th there, when they walk in the building, they'll go, oh, look at these people. They all look a little different. Uh, I didn't mean that like y'all look weird. Uh, you look different from each other. Uh, you, the, you know, they come from different backgrounds. They're different races. They're, they're, they're different income levels. Uh, they do different jobs. But this is, 
Well, look at this, this place where these people seem to love each other and will love me when I walk in. That'll make an impact. It's going to make an impact, right? Here's another verse that came to mind this week. And this one should hit us right here. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. You cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ apart from love. It is impossible. Church, we need to return to a passionate love for Jesus. And it'll change not only what goes on in here, but it will overflow out of these doors. But I can't make you do it. God gives us free will. We have to choose to love. At the end of the age, want to talk prophecy? At the end of the age, only one thing's going to matter. It's not how much you made. It's not how much you owned. It's not how much, what kind of car you drove. Not even how you treated people necessarily. It's not how well you followed the rules. It's going to be mattered. Did you love me? And did you let me take over your life? Love comes from God. God is love. If we're going to be God's people, love is what we're known for. Right theology that comes from love. Sometimes it's really hard to grasp the love of God. If you're here this morning and you feel like, I don't, I don't get it. Let me tell you this, and I, you, know, you don't know me very well, Lab, but let me just say this to every person in here. I will tell you without any reservation, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what your brokenness is, no matter the wounds that have happened in your life, no matter the shame and guilt that you may be carrying, God looks at you and he loves you. He loves you so much. It's an intense, fiery love. He looks at you and he goes, there's my kid. It's my kid, I love them. For those of us who are parents, we know, right, firsthand that our kids can be all sorts of messed up, Right? But we still look at them and go, man, I love them. They have my name. Well, you have the name of Jesus. Can we please see what God has done for us and then love that way? There's a story I want to end with this morning. And it's a, a story from a book, not by a Christian person, but by a surgeon, actually says this. Listen up. You may want to close your eyes as I read this. I stand by the bed where a young woman lies. Her face post-operative. Her mouth twisted in palsy, clownish. A tiny twig of the facial nerve. The one to the muscles of her mouth has been severed. She will be thus from now on. The surgeon had followed with religious fervor the curve of her flesh. I promise you that. Nevertheless, to remove the tumor in her cheek, I had to cut the little nerve. Her young husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed and together... They seem to dwell in the evening lamplight, isolated from me, private. Who are they, I ask myself, he and this wry mouth I have made, who gaze at and touch each other so generously, greedily? The young woman speaks. Will my mouth always be like this, she asks. Yes, I say, it will, because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent, but the young man smiles. 
I like it, he says. It's kind of cute. All at once I know who he is. I understand and I lower my gaze. One is not bold in an encounter with God. Unmindful, he bends to kiss her crooked mouth. And I am so close, I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate hers, to show her that the kiss still works. The kiss still works. The love of God who bends and twists to accommodate us, to come to us, to show us that we're still worthy of love. The love of God for us. Can we have that love for each other? Lord Jesus, would we be a loving place this morning? It's easy to love people in this room, but God, help us to love people that are outside this room. Help us to love that challenging neighbor, that difficult family member, that business uh, worker, somebody that's uh, involved in our, our line of work, God, who can be challenging. God, help us to see that our mission here on earth extends simply beyond our vocation or, or printing, but we are called to be your ambassadors, your agents, God. That we're called to love, to love like you. And sometimes, God, that's not easy, but it is our primary calling. God, help us to be salt and light in the world. And it's in your name we pray. It's in Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we worship.